Good day. Good day and welcome to NAC TV's Coffee Chat. My name is Lyle Watson and thank you for joining us and thank you to our guest for joining us today and our guest is Dan Mazur, our local Member of Parliament for Dauphin Swan River Nipua constituency. Uh, welcome to Coffee Chat, Dan, and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Yeah, well thanks for having me, Lyle. This is always, I always enjoy this segment. On, the, on NAC TV. Well, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I think we have a few things we would like to <coughs> talk about today. And uh, I, I think we'll start with some of the constituency is big, so there must be some highlights happening uh, across the constituency that our viewers would like a little update on. So, what are some of the highlights across the constituency? Well, at, you, at you know, I guess people believe it or not are getting all ready for spring, right? Like it, this is a very agriculture type of uh, uh, riding so uh, I know uh, interesting enough we had uh, roads thawing out and we had road restrictions at least down in Elton there in, in January like we didn't know when spring was going to come it was we had a bit of an early start but yeah as as you can tell things are we're, we're getting ready for spring so I think that you know as far as the mindset of course it's tax season we, we get into that about as far as the tax increases is going on with the carbon tax um, lots of fish derbies, lots of kind of, it, it, it's a good, it's a good time of year for people to just kind of reflect and then get ready for the next year. So, you know, a lot of people have a tendency to focus on January 1st, but I, I think as a riding in general, as being mostly agriculture, we focus more on the growing season and mm -hmm. uh, spring is actually one of my favorite time of years. It's, yes. it's before wood ticks, it's not too hot and you know, and you can, those baby plants, baby animals, everybody's starting to kind of, it's a renewal time of year. So. Yeah, looking forward to uh, May and June. That's for sure. Fresh start. Yes, yes that yes, is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's get into the uh, carbon tax and uh, mm. so-called axing the tax. I guess that didn't happen. Uh, so effective April first, we it, are getting it's going up twenty-three percent. So, in Lyle, this is this is the kind of the interesting thing. I, I guess any one of your viewers that are out there right now. If you could grab it, it'll be probably April 1st, April 2nd when you're watching this. If you could grab your last month's utility bill, if you use natural gas, if you use coal, any type of that type of energy, have a look at your, your energy bill, like what it was to heat your house or heat your barn, any, any kind of stuff. Propane is another one that you actually pay a carbon tax on. There'll be one line there for the actual cost of the natural gas, so it's called natural gas cost, and down on a separate line, it does actually say carbon tax. Right now, before the 23% increase, you're actually paying more in carbon tax than you are for the natural gas. And a lot of people don't realize that. And that's the thing that people, and especially now that it, the price is going up, that when you look at that number, it's actually the, the Liberal government wants to quadruple it in the next four years, or five years, actually. So keep that in mind. Whatever number you're looking at, say if your, car, if your natural gas bill was $100 and you're and your carbon tax bill was 110 because it is more, they want to quadruple that cost to you. And so make no bones about it. That's why we're so against it. It's, it's, not, it's not fair. It's a very regressive tax. And the whole idea of it, their whole, the whole idea is so you make it so uh, energy more expensive so you find that alternative. The big, the big uh, you know, problem with the, that whole plan is there is no alternative. And we keep on trying to tell this liberal government that is, we have no alternative, and uh, they don't seem to they don't seem to care, and they don't seem to listen. So uh, that that is why we're we're screaming from the top of the rafters. The other thing too, a lot of people, if you're a councilman, if you're a school trustee, ask your administration how much you're paying on a carbon tax. We're getting some numbers back. Uh, we have reached out to the, all the RMs. There's 38 RMs in this in this uh, riding. And we've asked every one of them, like, just to ask the administration how much you paid in a, in a carbon tax, and it's it's quite mm -hmm. staggering. A lot of people, and and uh, when I was in, especially schools, right? Like, you think about imposing a carbon tax on a school. Mm -hmm. How is that reducing emissions? And if, if if it's all about reducing emissions, like, how does that work, right? And you and you think about they're a publicly funded entity. So their tax dollars actually feeding that school, and the more ta like never mind about the tax on the tax on the tax like, like it's just unbelievable how much tax you're paying just to, for an energy program that is funded by in tax dollars. Yeah. So that's that's even worse, right? And um, so 
it, it's more of a um, right now it's bringing it to everybody's attention. Liberal government is increasing at 23 percent on April 1st. And then they are going to quadruple it in the next five years. So those are the, that's the takeaway on the carbon tax. Carbon tax is charged on everything from the fuel in your car, say natural gas, propane. Anytime you use those kind of products, they're they're based off of a, off a fuel uh, th th that type of energy. Not charged on your electricity, because there is no carbon emissions when you when you in, in hydro hydroelectricity doesn't produce any carbon emissions. Uh, so that's why we don't get charged. We're one of the lowest emitting provinces in Canada because we've been so blessed with, with uh, Manitoba Hydro. Yep. But having said that, though, we don't have access to Manitoba Hydro in, in many parts of this province. Even uh, some First Nations in northern uh, Manitoba are using diesel fuel to still power their the communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they're, they're paying even more. It, it's like they, they pay an exorbitant amount talk about an affordability issue right so have you been able to uh, find any measurable results that it's actually uh, increasing uh, uh, or lessening our climate change uh, so emissions have gone up but this to get this like this is, this is even you know we can ask questions like they're called order paper questions that we can ask of the departments so we, and it was an, on committee actually we asked for them to if they actually measured the results of the carbon tax, like it, it was there any measurement to say the results of of uh, imposing the carbon tax? Yeah, there is none. They don't measure it, so they impose a tax, but they don't measure the results. So it, it's it's anybody's guess, right? So and this is why we've been calling it a tax plan, not a, not a yeah. emissions plan. Because that's what it is. So in in your opinion, is it fair to say that? In all reality, we're not getting any benefits at all no. from the carbon tax. No, no. If anything, we've maybe like it's highlighted the discussion that we're going to do something. That's we were we were that case. But the liberals have been saying all the time along, this is we need a carbon tax. We need a car like need a a carbon tax, and we're going no, it not for Canada. It might work in a small country. It might work somewhere else. It doesn't work for Canada, and I think that's what they're missing. That's the key thing that they're missing in all this. It doesn't work for a vast country like Canada that has an abundance of natural gas and good, clean energy. Mm -hmm. If we just developed it, we could show the rest of the world that we could actually uh, lead many nations that are the want our product, be able to export it and get their emissions down. Not this government. The government doesn't want to do that either. They don't want any any kind of uh, you know uh, natural resources developing at all in Canada here now. So the province of Alberta, have they imposed the carbon tax on their residents uh, at all at this point in time? Yeah, Alberta, so they're one of the backstop provinces. So Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, New Brunswick. I think there's five that actually have a, a backstop program, like they're under the regime that we are on. And then now Eastern Canada has, they're getting, as they go beyond like $65, $70 a ton, they're starting to get taxed now. So they're starting to see the, the, the implications, like different provinces became uh, part of the um, carbon tax, but imposed by the federal government, not imposed by their provincial government. They And it, you'll hear in uh, the media too, where the liberals will start talking about, well, you know, if, you're, if your provincial government has a plan, bring it forward and we'll, we'll have a look at it. Pallister did have, the PC government of Manitoba back in 2016-17, did have the Manitoba Green Plan. And it was rejected by the Liberals. I was one of the people, I was with Keystone Agriculture Producers at the time as, as the president, and I was representing agriculture in those discussions. We had an agreement, we had, it was leveling off, and they, they rejected it. So for them to say now, so many years later, after taking hundreds of millions of dollars out of this province in the name of carbon tax and not giving it back to us is, is just hypocrisy. Yep. So in, in recently, the uh, Axe the Tax program on behalf of your government brought it to the House as a non-confidence vote, and it didn't pass. The non-confidence vote didn't pass. I, I don't understand uh, why it wouldn't have been more readily yeah. accepted across Canada. <laughs> well, either do I laugh. 
So you have the, so we're in a minority government. Everybody talks about all oh, minority governments are, are great, right? Like, I mean, and you can have your own opinion on that, but the particular makeup, uh, minority governments need coalitions. They need agreement from somewhere else to, to hold the government of the day. So while the Liberals are government right now, yep. the NDP are propping them up. They have a supply agreement, or basically it's, a, it's an agreement to every time, every time we talk about money in, uh, and vote on money, that's a confidence vote in itself. We, can, we don't say it out loud, but every time we vote on money, we vote confidence in the government. So the NDP have basically said we will supply and we will support you in confidence yep. till the next election, like you're, you know, you know uh, ongoing. So that, that's what basically the NDP's, you know, said, admit it quite, quite openly, right? So they're propping them up. And even on this one, the block even uh, blocked them up or supported them as well. Interesting thing about the block is they are just representing Quebec. Yep. And they have a different, they're not in a backstop program. Yep. They're not in, uh, um, uh, this doesn't impact them because they're under a cap and trade system, which is was established back when they when they brought the system in. They again, as the typical liberal government, right? They have a special deal with Quebec, and um, that gets some people very frustrated. But now Quebec's starting to realize that it's just because it they don't see it on their on their paperwork or on their bills. They are getting charged a carbon tax, especially those unregulated, like the the hog industry, space heating for barns, uh, all the transportation industry. Their goods come in from somewhere else in Canada. They all have a carbon tax on them. Yep. So it is increasing their costs, whether they they know it or not, and they're 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 starting to catch on to that as well. So they're not very happy about it as well. But it, it's this is why we don't hear a lot of conversations around Quebec and the carbon tax is because they're not a backstop program uh, province like Manitoba is here. Yeah. Well, thinking of taxes, it brings us up to the uh, topic of budget. Uh, uh, we're certainly seeing some variations in our federal budget and uh, the deficit seems to be growing a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and cost of housing and everything is going up and but so is our deficit in the government. What are some of your comments in terms of, of our budget today and uh, current budget and cost of housing, for example? Yeah, so I think it's April 16th or 17th. The, the budget's going to come down from the uh, um, Liberals are going to uh, table it. Um, this, this prime minister over the last eight years has acquired more debt than the, any other prime minister combined in the history of Canada. So you stop and think about it. Like def they've deficit spent and acquired more debt than all the other prime ministers combined in the history of Canada in this tenure of eight years. That is, like, it's staggering. So it's, it's $500 billion, and then it's plus over, over than a trillion plus, like the big, big, big deficit, right? So, and uh, when I'm talking to the schools, actually, last week, I, I pointed out to them, like, it's, them that should be very very frustrated with that and and when we start like right now we have we're paying on the interest alone to service that debt just like your household right we are it's equivalent to the number of health care number of dollars that go across for health care transfers it's really really close yeah so that starts chewing into our social programs it starts chewing into our ability to actually hold our you know uh, to hold uh, the federal government to uh, to uh, supply their commitments as well, yeah. right? Because they have a deficit to uh, a debt to pay off. So as as a country, so then what's going to happen, right? So we either get deeper and deeper in debt, or something has to has to uh, break, and uh, that's the challenge. These guys, what are they like? So liberals are already proposing they've already try put out the trial balloon. Oh, we're just going to run another forty billion dollar deficit. 40 maybe 50 billion dollars like that's the, they're just talking like the chump change now before covid like if if we ran 10 20 billion in deficit like that was we were losing our minds they've doubled it in a bit and it's just like normal normal uh days going on and just think if you ran your household like this like how yeah. how long would the the you know would your utilities get not cut off right uh, mm -hmm. what else would you have to give up like you know what kind of groceries would you go shopping to same kind of thing happens to a country when you have this anchor 
behind you call, and you're trying to pay off your debt and yet trying to service and, and run your household or run your country and run your, your programs that you said you were going to run and you're, you're basically the steward of these programs, right, Lyle? And then all of a sudden we say, no, 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 we went and, spot, we went and bought a new car. So have a nice day. You know, you, you don't get your programs. We, we're sorry. We'll just increase your taxes. Yeah. That is what gets everybody's, you know, ire up. And, you know, that's what makes people mad. They, they have a responsibility for the Canadian taxpayer and they've, they, they've basically blown it. And uh, that they should be held to account to it. And this is why we're calling it non-confidence. Yeah. That's back to that, like, we've lost total confidence in this government, to say the least. So the uh, cost of housing is a big factor to Canadians uh, and social housing being part of that. Is, is there a way to balance the budget or at least fix the budget and still provide all the services that we as citizens of Canada are demanding? Yes, yeah, and it, it, it is, we have to, well, so we ax the tax, so we get that monkey off people's back. So you don't actually pay double the price for energy to heat your house. So you get your, you got more dollars all of a sudden, more disposable dollars. So you get your household under control, right? Yep. So then as far as building the homes, this is, uh, I've been asking different RMs. So uh, when I've been touring around and uh, talking to RMs, like what is, so if you went, we want to build more homes in, in say, Nipua here, like what's the plan? And uh, well, we need more infrastructure. We can't do it. We're totally full, or you know, no one can afford the houses because it's it's too too much money. So when talking to developers, though, and it it it's, it varies from from RM to RM. So I, as I get to talking to them, I'm gonna, it's quite interesting to hear the conversations. Like some RMs don't allow like building of we call them small homes or you know below mm -hmm. a thousand square foot. Well, that's a, that's the house I moved into in 1985. I guess yes. thousand square foot bungalow, three bedroom bungalow. It was fine. My wife and I we, we started off, started a family in that, and finished like it had a basement. Like, it's against the rules now of development for the for many of these communities. Like, right? so we're gonna. That's one of the things we're gonna. Like when Pierre talks, our leader talks about getting rid of the gatekeepers. That that red tape, that type of policy needs to get removed. So. What we're going to put in it is an incentive to build more homes. Like, how can we clear that pathway so developers can come in and say, here, the, the town wants to develop this square block or this community, this type of seniors living or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, low income living or just normal living, uh, affordable. Uh, that, you know, here's the, here's the median income for the area. Here's what 25% of your wages should, this is a house that you should be able to afford, right? Make that kind of affordable housing and let, let, the, let it go. But you got to take the handcuffs off of the developers and, and the cities or the, the towns and the local governments really need to get their, their um, head wrapped around what it means to build modern day houses for, for what the people want for houses instead of mansions, right? Like it, it was normally that progression, like the people would build, you know, 2,000 square foot houses as they progressed and we uh, got older and we, we, we could because we had wealth. Well, there's, there's a, a massive amount of, of people that just want a, a big starter home. Yeah. And, you know, it is a problem when you, when you can't, by bylaws, can't even build it in your community. That, that needs to be readdressed. And people yeah. are starting to get their head wrapped around it. So I think there is, there is opportunities and there is, more importantly, uh, developers and builders we got it right here happening in Nipah actually I was very uh, stop at uh, this and that mm -hmm. they've got a new project going on there very mm -hmm. excited to see what they they end mm -hmm. up doing they they um, they remind me a little bit like a, a mod well they're a mo module home yeah but they you can scale them up and yeah. they're very practical insulated like they're top rated as far as uh, you know affordable even once you own it that you can actually heat it and afford to like it's a normal kind of house that good good for a starting family or a young family so very excited to see what that kind of could do and it's, it's right here in our, our backyard here in Nipua. Yes it is. You mentioned infrastructure and uh, of course uh, infrastructure is a partnership between provincial and federal in terms of cost and budgeting for 
there's been some snide remarks about potholes on our streets on social media yeah. <laughs> recently. Uh, pictures of people swimming in the potholes and the streets <laughs> and so forth. Um, and, you know, it's no joke when you drive across our streets and down our highways. There's lots of uh, infrastructure repair that's required. Yeah. How, how do we face that uh, uh, in the coming future and still keep our budget uh, manageable. Well, and this is, so highways, potholes, like this is all provincial. Uh, and having said that though, there is this, this marrying, like, so when you talk infrastructure for a town, for Lagoon though, uh, sewer and water, there, there is this marrying of, of uh, projects, right? Yeah. Um, so I think when we have this conversation though, on streets, I am very much a proponent of if if you have at a local level are just saying uh you know we want the street slowed down and then for the local council says yes we want the street slowed down and then you go to winnipeg or into the ndp government now they say no no we're not going to slow it down like that's a gatekeeper that is a bureaucrat standing in the middle of this whole thing and you're the ones we all know in our communities what is safe and not safe and what needs to be addressed and what we need to address that. And that's why our, our leader, Pierre Polyev, is very, he, he's under, uh, he makes it under no uncertain terms that like RMs and, and uh, but um, provincial governments, like all levels of government have to start working together on this. If this is our true goal, like why is that happening? Like I, 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 just, I just don't understand that. Like, I mean, and we, we all as, elected officials kind of go well it's their responsibility that's one attitude i i don't like that approach i think there's there's something to be said about well if it's your jurisdiction then why aren't you feeling like what else is uh happening that is standing in the way of that is that just one person being you know obstinate or is it is yeah. an actual government policy that but we need to have more conversations with our government and our, their elected officials uh, so they can go into the legislature or go into Ottawa and and armed, uh, you know, with the bureaucracy to, to hash that all out. At the end of the day, they're supposed to be stewards of these departments and of what's going on. And uh, if they're if they're pushing back, that that shouldn't happen. Um, and we got to pick our priorities, right? Like uh, you you think about the situation. Oh, back to the potholes. So we've got the anchor going down. We're trying to pay off this debt. Um, and so, but are we going to pick a priority of, are we going to fill the pothole first so people can get to work? Yeah. Or are we going to, what else could we going to pick? Like, a, like there is a, always a trade-off, right? So I think the, the way around this is get more focused on what's really important to people so they can work um, and then see where that works and work with our provincial governments. Like it, I'm, I'm, I'm under, under no illusion that... Uh, you know, the politics is, is ripe for every layer of government, but at the end of the day, we're elected on behalf of the people and we should be focusing on what's important to that community. Do you think that's a possibility to see the RMs, or the uh, municipal governments, provincial governments, and the federal governments working closer together with common goals and uh, leaving the politics out of it? Do you yes. Think that, do you think it's a possibility? That's the way I operate it. I, like, I mean, I, I don't, on, I, yes. Yes, I can't. I get, besides the rhetoric, which you see on the, the advertising, right, and the, the policies, I, I've always, what I bring to the table is, is, is focus on the policy. This is, and this is why I, either I get so frustrated with the carbon tax, right? We're not, it's, it's a liberal policy that's punishing rural Canada. And we all know it. And why isn't that government doing it? But meanwhile, we have a provincial government right now. Have they said it's not good? I don't think so. Right, like I mean, I know the like it's it's putting like what is the province saying about this? Like let them let them answer it, right? Yep. I'm not here to tell them, but here's our policies. Where do you fit into that policy, and how can our governments start working together? So you pick your priorities. Like it, even if there is, if the, the government at the end of the day said, here you got a million dollars, you as a local government go pick your priorities. Maybe not enough, but go pick your priorities. And we'll support you. And if you don't get that million dollars, well, then come talk to us, come talk to whatever. But don't stand in the way and say, no, well, you can do this project because we really like it. That's where the, the politics and this is where the, the kind of, I think, uh, more um, troubling things happen is 
the local people know what they need and what they require, right? And if you ask them, like, what's really important to you and where your priorities are, I think it it would all work out way better for the province and for our country. Yeah, yeah. An another uh, item of discussion is the increase in crime that we're seeing um, across our country and uh, more so in some provinces than others. But um, how how do you have any suggestions or thoughts about how we control this increase in crime and starting to eliminate some of it? Yeah, like we, we need to get violent repeat offenders off the streets. But we have, uh, there was two bills, C-75 and C-5, I believe. So one was a catch and release program, like you could go back and they catch you in the morning and they release you back at night and you could go serve time and back in your community. So, and this, that, that doesn't work well, especially small communities, so that was one. The other one was uh, repeat offenders too. You. Um, you couldn't um, just because it was mandatory minimums. They they, they did away with those as well. So it, it you could repeat and repeat and repeat and there was no accountability to it. If we just went after that and alone, like you would take away 80% of the crime and you'd, you'd take away 5% uh, of the people. Like that's how, how mixed up it is right now. It's, it's the same repeat violence and especially violent violent offenders yeah. like if we just started there they're the kind of the the root of the it just keeps on escalating right and they, they have to be held to account we have to and more importantly we have to hold the, the, we got to make sure our communities are safe uh i don't like a, a, a person that's beating somebody up a senior up coming back from the groceries and then meanwhile they're serving time uh watching the senior walk down the same street uh you know 24 hours later like yeah. that's not right that is not right. That that person should be held, especially if it's the third or fourth time, assaulting the same person. And that stuff goes on every day across Canada. And, and it's more, I would say, uh, impactful in a small community where everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Uh, so that's what we, we plan on stopping the crime. That's our, that's our other policy. Get rid of those two uh, and bring back uh, mandatory minimums but more importantly, uh, make sure violent repeat offenders are taken off the streets so we can, we can start getting our communities back safe yeah. again. Well, that would be a plus. <laughs> um, you're well into your second term, Dan, uh, mm -hmm. as being our MP for Dauphin, Swan River, Nipua. Uh What are some of the challenges you faced and are facing in terms of representing our constituents and right. being in opposition and not being in power? Yeah, well, it's, there's everything from we can we can produce documents. We can ask the departments of, of certain documents, right, or certain things that are going on. When you're in opposition, they don't really have to answer to you. Uh, you have to go either through the minister or through the department, right? They're only at worried about keeping the, the government or the or the minister happy at the time. So. Uh, any, that's one thing. So you're kind of set up at a little bit of disadvantage. I have learned though, uh, especially on the, on the uh, like say um, immigration file, um, on the environment file, like some park stuff that we've been working on. Uh, if you do get the minister in front of you, like, you know, you can bring it to their attention that we need this uh, done for this individual. Yep. Um, it usually happens very well. Can, can you uh, ch just tell us and our viewers about, you're, you're, you're the shadow, shadow minister in a department and you're also vice chair of a standing committee. Yeah, so my, my two roles, so shadow minister, basically critics, um, we used to call it critics. And what they, department is that? Dan? So for rural economic development and connectivity. So that is, so I, the shadow minister part of it is, uh, so they have a, the government has a minister of rural economic development yep. and uh, broadband, it's called. But that's it's Goody Hutchins. She's from Newfoundland, so I'm her shadow. I look at her files and whatever she announces and stuff like that. So that's why I, I, I care for. That's who I kind of critique, or that's who I make hold account to. That's my my shadow minister or minister that I I oppose uh, to or hold to account, I guess. And then meanwhile, being vice chair of the environment and uh, what's it called? Environment committee, we'll call it, Envy. Um, that is 
uh, certain responsibilities as far as organizing when we go into so what happens at committees is we'll at the second reading of a bill a bill will come through there's uh, three different readings when it comes to the House of Commons second reading after second reading and we debate it in the House of Commons it comes with some tweaks and some information but then it comes in for review into committees into different committees so we'll get an environment bill and then we bring in uh, expert witnesses about the bill or about a study that we're doing like right now we're studying fresh water actually so we've had it uh, we have numerous meetings on it and brought in uh, experts from all over the world actually to talk about fresh water and legislating fresh fresh water and what it what it means like you know how to develop how to move forward with fresh water policy I as a country mm -hmm. so it, it's been a very interesting study actually and um, so what uh, my role as vice chair is um, is to or organize a committee uh, here's the witnesses who and our, we have uh, four representatives including myself um, on the committee on the on the committee so we'll uh, there's different times that we ask questions and different rotations I'm also working with the chair on, a, on agendas so I kind of uh, I don't say negotiate but like make sure that the committee is running fine for our team if there's some questions that we have to ask we bring it up through through a conservative's eyes of course or through and uh, our policies and asking that so that's how what committee works all about so it's more of a research or reviewing legislation and then there's uh, the rest of the House of Commons which is 90% of the time it's either reading or debating legislation yep. which I, I have um, it's uh, and then every day we have question period so question period a lot of people like it is a show there is a there is a it's a, it's a special time in the in the House of Commons. Everybody shows up for question period. That's a, that's the expectation, especially as opposition. So it's the only time in our in our day that we can actually, as opposition parties, ask the government questions. See? so then they have so the way it works is uh, it's for one hour, and uh, I think I don't know, we get forty spots I think or something like that. But there's a thirty five second you have 35 seconds to ask the question and 35 seconds for them to respond. Not answer, but respond. So you never know what's going to come out of their <laughs> yeah. mouth, right? Uh, so that's the way that works. And it's sometimes it, a lot of it, it has got into the theatrics. But there are some real legitimate questions. I don't know if you watch it. Uh, you can go to ourcommons.ca mm -hmm. uh, and like actually it has it blocked off there. You can watch this question period. Lots of podcasts now. They actually make it like a sports commentary. Yeah. Like they'll have a guy at a podcast. If you're watching YouTube videos or anything, they'll uh, they'll actually um, they'll say, oh, there you go. He scored a blow or he scored, you know knockout round or whatever like that during debates. But it, it, it's quite interesting. But they, we do find out a lot of information, and you know, I, it's funny. I played a clip uh, between uh, our our leader um, Pierre Polyev and Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, uh, on question period, and it's those, and it was like four questions in a row, like thirty-five, thirty-five, back and forth, right? He wouldn't answer the question about the housing accelerator and building houses, and I I stopped the clip midway, and I said, okay, well, why do you think he's not answering the question? And they're going well. He does e a. He doesn't know the answer, or he doesn't it, it, like it's not good. So they saw right through it, like, and it was two more rounds, right? So ended up they built. It was under this housing accelerator program that the Liberals uh, announced that it was going to build a whole bunch of houses in Canada. Well, they built zero houses in the program, yeah. <laughs> and meanwhile, so millions of dollars. So that's that's our, uh, our so question period is for an hour every day, and then and that's it. Normally, though, we're debating bills 90% uh, of the time in the House of Commons. So in terms of a standing committee, do you and your colleagues work together at a more amicable level in a standing committee than you would in the House of Commons or in question period and places like that? Uh, do you actually work together for a common good on those committees? We can. We can. There's, there's depending that everybody's put in there for a purpose right it's just like a it is there's a lot of comparisons to be made just like a sports team right like everybody's got a different purpose yeah. or a different role to play in, in any different situation right but when you have a government telling you like here like basically falsehoods and not correct things right 
you have to call Moda on that, no matter where wherever that platform is. And when you're, we have, I have to say, like working. That's where you get to know committee members a lot better. Uh, you know the personalities and how how people work. Like, we all know we have a job to do. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, we've got a study to do, or we got legislation to pass. Right there, during studies, you can probably you can usually get some pretty good stuff uh, going on. But you have to remember, though, we are a loyal opposition. Whenever we we enter, so our role in in nature is to ask questions. Like if so, if we have a witness in front of us that's not good for the government, well, we're going to expose that during committee. Now, does that make the Liberals feel good and is that amicable? But that's our job, is to hold them account yep. like, as their loyal opposition. So I guess I, the, ultimately I'm, I'm doing my job, whether the Liberals like it or not, I'm, I'm sorry. But I mean, the reality is the reality. Now, can you dig in the dagger and, you know, twist it off? And like, I'm, I'm not that kind of character, but, you know, I think if they're they should be, and if they feel the heat, well, that's that's on them, not on me. Yeah. yeah, you know. yeah. Another thing that's come to mind is uh, uh, there's from time to time in governments there's scandals, and one has been brought to the attention of Parliament uh, through Arrive Canada, and there's mm-hmm. been a few million dollars, according to the Auditor 60. General, that kind of have disappeared. Uh, have you had any experience uh, or? Any thoughts on that particular scandal? Yeah, and so in or, and what is Arrive Canada? So right? Arrive Arrive Can was an app that the federal government decided that they, they wanted to create uh, during COVID, at the beginning of COVID. So if people were traveling around or coming into our country, they could monitor them to see if they had their they would actually register that they were vaccinated, and then of course arriving and so you could pre pre do all that. So Arrive Can was basically an app for for travelers coming into Canada uh, for Canadians. Well, so they said, okay, well, we need to, we need to do a, a release, like a call for proposals, right? So they said, and we have $80,000. The department decided they have $80,000 to, to create this app. Well, so everything ensues. So GC uh, Strategies, I think they're called GC. Anyways, company, these two guys, uh, called GC, we'll call them, a Government of Canada Strategies, uh, got the contract, and then they proceeded to spend $20 million, not sixty or 80000 So then, and to further realize it, so there was something going on. And, and then meanwhile, they have other contracts of up to $60 million that they've been given other contracts. We don't know. We're just investigating it now, whether it was for the Arrive Can app or whatever like that. But you'll, you'll know this, this this company was given a contract to, dev- to devise an app, Arrive Can app, for $80,000. They spent $20 million in to, to do that. And they never, to, to create an app that never did work and we're not using right now. And to add insult to injury, so they're an IT, they were hired as an IT company to design that app. They didn't design it they farmed it out so they took 20 million dollars to take a commission off to hire someone else wow. and that and that's and this is where the trouble starts happening right we don't even know uh like what who did the actual work for the for the uh, app when it was finally delivered we, we're still trying to figure that out like and how how does this happen right there's there's reports now that they were wine and dining different uh, liberal uh, bureaucrats um, or you know government uh, entities um, MPs where they in, in implied it all right they, to get favors like right? so all these different contractors that they were hiring says mm-hmm. so, come on Lyle, I got a government contract for you oh, yeah we can get a bit more than 80,000 but uh, here we'll, we'll make it up right so there's a whole bunch of rules that were kind of mixed up with and uh, it's in, under an investigation right now, and uh, that, that's the problem. So you talk about, you know, how do we reduce costs? We could start there yes. quite easily. So it's under investigation. So will we actually get to the bottom of it at some point in time, or does it eventually get swept under the carpet? Or <laughs> Well, if we have our way with it, we'll definitely, it's got to get found out, right? Like if there was, if there was, I think it's still 
uh, up in the air, the RCMP, who they're investigating, if they're investigating anybody officially yep. versus the government, because the government can actually review themselves as well. Auditor General looked at it and said, well, I can't even follow the money. And that's another problem, right? Like they're, 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 they're counting the practices that were being followed were not correct or were not, uh, I guess, for public review. Yep. So, and when you're Auditor General that has a, a, a lot of resources to go figure this stuff out and can't, uh, that's a problem. Yep. Then this is where the $60 million all of a sudden starts showing up because somehow it's related back to that original contract. So, but we can't prove how. So, or what? Or what, yeah. So. Another uh, thought that comes to mind is uh, immigration, and uh, mm. uh, we've seen some uh, uh, issues over immigration, and uh, there's certainly some new policies coming out that the government's putting in place. Uh, what is your thought on our immigration uh, situation and people coming to our country? It's, well, you know, I, I, I guess I thank anybody that comes to this country and wants to make it a you know a better country and start a new life in here like thank you thank you for that like i i can't imagine uh pulling up your roots and and, and moving to a different country um how they've been treated when they come to canada has been i have to say is appalling in many cases uh right now what the liberals have been historically focused on is numbers they say oh well we're going to bring in a million uh, immigrants right this is on top of a housing crisis that we have. No one, people don't have places to live. They can't afford houses. We got a shortage of supply in that, but we're going to bring in a million more people because we just, that's a number, right? Yeah. There's no plan behind their numbers. And that's been their problem right from day one here, Lyle. Like, and it, it is really, you're starting to see the fruits of their bad policy. And this is why it's such a mess. Never mind about the delays inside of the immigration system itself. It is getting better. Yes, they said COVID was going to stop things, but we uh, there is no plan to bring in a, a um, like a, an expert or a, a person that is well qualified, say in Australia or in, in the Philippines. If it's a case of a doctor or nurse, there's there's no ability, like streamlined way to uh, to bring those people into Canada to uh, start them working. There's lots of layers of gatekeepers. There's everything from your your provincial jurisdictions, but your your associations like for doctors and, and nurses, right? They, they, they're they the governing bodies of each province and they're different in every province in Canada. So what we have is a policy proposal. It's called a, a Blue Seal program. It's for professionals. So right now in Canada, right across Canada, we have a Red Seal program for trades. So it's like you can be a carpenter anywhere in Canada. It's interprovincial. They all have a standard, right? They write a test and they this is the way they, they time and and writing gets you gets you a license to practice in Canada. We want to do the same thing with uh, professions. So focusing at first on doctors and nurses. So um, say if you're over in the Philippines, and you uh, there will be a national test that you can write while you're still over there. Say if you're in school in the mm -hmm. Philippines, you'll write the Canadian test. Within 60 days, you'll hear back from the Canadian government uh, to say you've passed your test or here's your proficiency work on this, 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 you can challenge the test again. Once you come, you get your, you say yes, and then say, oh, here, Nipah needs some doctors and nurses. You come in say, well, just stick to the doctor. Doctor comes in and says, yeah, I got a, a doctor in here from the Philippines, and he, I'm going to mentor him. I'm gonna, he's gonna be an intern with me. Uh, he'll start practicing day one, working and meeting with patients. And at first he'll work side by side, Make sure that the doctor that's supervising him, make sure he's, he can understand the system. And, you know, even the filing systems and how it all works in Canada versus the Philippines, get all used to that and then let them start working so they're part of a community. Uh, once, that, say, that probationary period's for three months, four months, whatever like that, they stay in that area, they'll get a regional license, and they're working. But the, and uh, they'll, they'll stay with that community as as you know, as long as they're, they're working as a doctor or a nurse, mm -hmm. whatever they were trained in and, and brought in for. Then if they want to go on, and the next part of that is if they want to go anywhere else in Canada, well, then they can get into the national standards part of it and, and start moving around. But the, the, biggest, the biggest difference in, in this whole plan is, Lyle, they're, they're working from day one, 
and they know the community they're getting to know the community that they're going to stay a while for that's the biggest thing right now right to go get your even to go get your training that will bring them into nipawa here they'll start say at maple leaf or well who knows like we're here in some start as a taxi driver not even not even do working in the profession that they came over for right right, right. Uh, because there's no positions or they can't get in or they can't pass the test yep. like they so what do they do they they were trained all their life like you know most of their life for is to be a nurse or a doctor and there's no ability for them to to uh, go away and or t unless they go and invest again and get more education which is ridiculous like uh, um, so w that is our when we form government we're going to implement a blue seal program okay. for profession and that could go for doctors nurses accountants like all professions yep. uh dentists uh, like but it, it's, it's going to be uh, the, the biggest, I think, the barrier in this whole thing is the, the approval organizations or the, 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 the people that give the licenses away. So the, the doctor's associations, the, the nurse's associations, right? Like those people that issue those licenses, that's going to be the, the biggest pushback. And uh, we're going to have to be, as communities, back to this community uh, theme is... We're going to have to know that this is what we want and this is why we want it. And we want to, we, we need no, more doctors and nurses and that's the way to bring them in. And it's, it's reasonable. Everybody wins, yeah. right? You don't have to go get re-educated to some different standard. You can start looking after people and yep. life goes on. Yeah. So what, what about the non-professionals? Is, is there employment for the non-professional? Well, that, that you coming? go under trades, right? If you want to go under a trade, you can go and... Like that, that system seems to be fine. Yeah. Um, and what about foreign students? I think the universities are. Well, there's some concern there. There, there is, there is a mess with the universities because they've been relying on on foreign students as cash, cash uh, cows, pardon the expression. But they've been really uh, mining the the foreign students for for money for inflow, right? And uh, there, it's Manitoba actually. We can because there's not too many big universities, but you get into Ontario, there's some um, uh, uh, kind of questionable practices and what kind of courses are being offered to these foreign students. They're paying, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for them. What do they got at the end of the day, and what qualifications, right? Uh, but it's just to get more money in too. So um, it is a concern. I I do, but if that was their only way in, if they had the wherewithal. Like, that is a concern for them. What do you do in the interim? Like, what's this mean to the people that are here now? And are they going to have any different qualifications? I don't think... We're, we're talking about a platform, like, bringing new people in. We can't go back to what's going on here now because they're part of the system, right? Unless they challenge the national test and they say, okay, well, here I'm trained. But it's pretty hard, like, uh, I think about, the, you know say a, a doctor that's been driving taxi for the last 10 years, pretty hard for him to come back now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if it's only been a year, well then let's, let's look at that. Like, I mean, that would be the common sense thing to, to look at, you know, or if they want to challenge the test and they happen to pass and they've been three years, of, like, you know, depending on your age. I know I've had lots of like 50 year old nurses uh, talking to them like from the Philippines and they're going, well, I'm not gonna retest like I'll, I'll, I'm okay at doing this. I'm still a nurse, yeah. but I'm doing this other level stuff. Like I, I don't want to go back. Maybe this will be an opportunity for him. Like it, it's not that onerous a test if you've been been here for uh, so many years, and you can just level up and away you go. Get a mentor and yeah. get qualified that way. So, yeah. Dan, is there any other events or happenings uh, that are going on in Ottawa that uh, is affecting? Uh, our constituency here and our constituents that uh, you want to uh, discuss with our viewers? Yeah, today? I, you know, well, this is what everybody always asks what you do, right? Like, I mean, and how do you, I, I really, um, I think the budget coming down in this spring, everybody's calling a, for a non-confidence, like let's have, a, let's have an election, right? Um, and always, always remember that we are the opposition right now. People are asking us, so, so what are you guys going to do? Well, that's, that's the government of the day. That's the Liberal government actually asking us what we're doing, or even the NDP, for that matter of fact, right? So what's your solution? Well, that's not our job. You'll find out what our solution is 
during the election, like when we when we actually have an election. Yeah. Right now, we're just holding the government to account. They are telling you false things, like things that are not accurate. They are not, and I, I haven't ever seen it this, uh, this, I don't want to say bad, but I, 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 I don't know how they get away with it, and I think it's just people just think, oh, well, they're politicians and they're just barking at each other, right? So I would ask of you, if you're not following me on Facebook, follow me on Facebook on my social media post. We, we do try to keep people up to date on there and what, what I'm working on in Ottawa. A lot of people don't realize that or uh, half a year, basically, 160 days in Ottawa, give or take, and then the other half of the year I'm out in the riding. Um, don't don't hesitate to reach out to me. I, I'm gonna. We're doing for the summer, I guess. Uh, um, coming up, we we, we sit until uh, I think mid June, um, like three four weeks, and then a week off, and then three, another three four weeks. But um, so in June we're having uh, barbecues again, passport clinics again. Yep. So keep your eyes uh, peeled for that mm. and come on out. You can always stop by our NEPO office uh, right beside the chicken chef or right across the co-op there mm -hmm. on the Yellowhead or in our Dauphin office as well and up at, uh, the, beside the, at, the, at the mall there beside the Walmart entrance as well. And you're, you're always welcome. Give us an email or, um, or, or reach out. And if you happen to be in Ottawa, please come like, at least give, us, give me a heads up that you're in town and Maybe we'll be able to cross paths. I'll get you into Parliament and get to sit in your seat. Yeah. Well, well I thank you very much for uh, taking the time, Dan. Our uh, time has kind of slipped away on us today. Yeah. And uh, But I thank you for joining us on Coffee yeah. Chat. Thank and, you, uh, We wish you the best in the future and keep up the good work in Ottawa. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And to our viewers, uh, thank you for watching. And uh, uh, my name is Lyle Watson. Until next time. Stay happy, stay healthy.